Our God in heaven, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you for life. We're grateful for the sacrifice that has been made for us through Jesus. We're mindful of the pain and anguish that he endured. Help us to just appreciate that every day and live our lives in a way that we're following in his footsteps. I pray that you'll be with us tonight. Help us to honor you in our thoughts and just studying about your word. Help us to take away things that will allow us to be more like Christ in all that we do. Please be with our family, our members that aren't here, and just pray that you'll watch over them, those that are in sickness and those that are traveling. Pray, please be with them. And just help us to encourage one another to make it to heaven. We're thankful for Jesus and his love. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 But I do now. We're going to be looking at uh, page nine in your lesson books, uh, outline of Isaiah here. And this kind of introduces us to where we're going to go for the rest of the, uh, the study. Last week, we noticed chapter six. We spent some time talking about chapter six. Um, we're not going to revisit that as we go through the outline. But we're going to use it. The reason we spent time looking at it up front is because... It serves really as a theological foundation for the rest of the book, okay? So having said that, given that big old reminder, what's Isaiah chapter 6 about? There's two primary things. <coughs> what? Governance. The governance of God, okay? God is on the throne. That's the first thing. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah sees this vision of God on the throne. And the reign of God, the governance of God, is going to be at the forefront of this entire book of Isaiah. He is going to demonstrate his rule in the nations of men and his judgment of those nations. And that judgment is going to be characterized by what aspect of God? It says it three times. He's holy, holy, holy. That's what the seraphim, the fiery ones, are, are crying out as they fly around the throne. And because he's holy, his judgments are going to be characterized by righteousness. All of his judgments are righteous. The, the core aspect of God is portrayed in those Isaiah is God's holiness. And God's holiness tells us, really, that we can trust him. We can trust him to judge righteous judgment. We can trust him to do that which is good and benevolent. We can trust him to love us, and we can trust him to save us. We can trust him to answer when we call upon him. We can trust him to help us. And this is one of the things that God is trying to get his people to see and to understand. It's one of the messages of Isaiah, and we're going to see that a little bit tonight. So that's chapter 6. That serves as the foundation. Now, there's 66 chapters in the book. The book is logically divided into two parts. The first part is chapters 1 through 39, the second part is chapters 40 through 66. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But the first half of the book, those first 39 books, in a nutshell, can you tell me what they primarily deal with? Who's the big bad guy in the first chapters? Assyrian. The Assyrian Empire, right? And that's what it's going to deal with. It's going to deal with the Assyrian Empire, which is the dominant world empire at this time. And God is going to use Assyria as the means of bringing judgment upon Israel and Judah to a degree. Okay? And we're going to see that as we work our way through those chapters. We're going to look at 
two passages in those first 39 chapters that give us an idea of what's going on tonight. Take a look at chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. And the question on your uh, worksheet, your lesson book says, what does chapter 8, verses 6 through 8 speak of? The people rejected God, and that's why the Assyrians are going to come to punish them. Okay. They've refused the help and the peace of God. Ahaz is primarily the one that has done that. And, of course, the people follow him. And as a result, God is going to bring judgment upon them through Assyria. Let's go ahead and read the passage. Inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly and rejoice in resin and in Remaliah's son. Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. All right, so there is the proclamation. There is the judgment that's going to be visited upon Judah. Let's go back and notice a few specific things about it. The first phrase there in verse 6, inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly. What's that talking about? Anybody have any idea? Just talking about the gentle flowing streams that would feed the pool of Jerusalem. God gives them water to drink. They flow gently. It's just a nice little brook, if you will, or a little stream. Okay? And what he's doing is he's comparing that with the river in verse 7. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty. What river is this? It's the Euphrates. Okay? And the Euphrates always stands for the idea of aggression coming from the north, coming from the east. Um, the Babylonians would have to circumnavigate, if you will, or come around the Euphrates. The Assyrians would have to come around the Euphrates. The Euphrates was not a gentle little stream. The Euphrates was mighty, it was strong, it was a major river in the area. And so what God is saying is, you have refused these gentle flowing streams representing God's willingness to help them and stand by them and deliver them from resin and from Remaliah. Okay, the resin of Remaliah, yep, Remaliah's son. And um, you have chosen instead to put their trust in who? Assyria. In Assyria, right? In Tiglath Pileser. Okay? And he is described here as this mighty raging river that's going to flood. Okay? Interesting statement or phrase down at the end of verse 6. You have refused Shalom that flows softly and rejoiced in resin and Remaliah's son. What is that talking about? I mean, wasn't Ahaz and weren't everybody in Court trembling like the leaves on a tree over resin and Remaliah's son. Weren't they terrified of these two? And now it says they're rejoicing in them. Anybody have an idea what this might be in reference to? Mine says they both died. Yeah, they both died. Okay. In fact, God told they had, you don't have to worry about these two smoking stubs of firebrands. Right? Because I'm going to take care of them. But Ahaz refused that, and he put his trust in Tiglath Pileser, who did deal with him. But then he turns now to Judah. Okay? And so the idea that you rejoice in Rez and Remaliah's son 
is most likely talking about the fact that, okay, you rejected my help, you went to this wicked empire, and sure enough, they killed Resident Remaliah. They, they dealt with them, and you're rejoicing in that. But now, you're going to suffer the consequences because Tiglath Pileser and Syria are not satisfied with Resident Remaliah. Now they're going to come for you. They're going to come for Judah. And this is going to take place over about one, two, three, I think four Assyrian kings. Now, later on in chapters 36, 37, 38, we're going to be reading about the fourth king, Sennacherib, right? Who is invading the land. And so when he's talking about that, he's talking about this river now is going to come up. He's going to go over all this channel. And he is going to pass through and he will stretch out his wings over your whole land, the breadth of your land, Emmanuel. Remember, Jerusalem didn't fall, did it? God delivered Jerusalem. And delivered Jerusalem primarily because of Hezekiah's faith and trust in Isaiah. Right? What does the universe, um, or the middle of verse 8 say? It says, He will pass through Judah, he will overflow and pass over, he will reach up to the neck. This is being described as a flood, and he's saying that Assyria is going to come in and he's going to reach up to the neck. What does that mean? The head's still going to be there. Yeah. You're going to get right up to here, right? Any higher, you're doomed pretty much. Yeah, the water goes over the mouth of the nose. Your toast. Okay. So, what does he mean by that? He's going to reach up to the neck. Judah will survive. What? Judah will survive. Yeah. The other Judah's going to survive. He is not going to take Jerusalem. But well, well, they're barely going to survive because uh, Snacker did tremendous havoc to yeah. most of Judah. Yeah. He, most he, of the cities were destroyed. Yeah, about 47, I think, are completely destroyed, right? And people are carried away captive, people are destroyed. Uh, we know about all the atrocities that Assyria is the of when they wage war. So they're going to survive, but just barely. Okay? And God, because of his um, love for Zion and his love for David, is not going to let the Assyrians take Jerusalem, right? So there's the prophecy. And what we're going to find is we're going to find that fulfilled by the time we get to the end of this first section. All right? So there's, there's what's going to go on. There's what's going to happen. God is going to use Assyria as the rod of his anger. Okay? Does Assyria think that that's what's going on? Does Assyria think that they're fulfilling God's purpose? Not in the slightest. They're thinking that they're just, you know, the big guy on the block, and they're going to come in, they're going to do what they want. And they don't realize that God is the one that's wielding them as a woodsman would wield an axe. Okay? All right. So that brings us then to the conclusion of this whole history, if you will, in the first part of the book. Take a look at chapter 37. Chapter 37, we're going to read verses 33 through 38. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, <coughs> nor build a siege mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then in verses 36 through 38, we have a fulfillment of what God said there. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people rose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So 
So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adramalak and Sherezer, his son, struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And then Ezra Hatton, his son, reigned in this place. So God fulfilled his promise. What's interesting here is we have all of this, this, this challenge and this going back and forth and the test of faith for Hezekiah and Jerusalem with the Assyrians saying, don't put your trust in God. Yeah, that's one of the major themes. Don't put your trust in God. Hezekiah and Isaiah are saying, we've got to put our trust in God. And Sennacherib's emissary is not always saying, you can't put your trust in God. Look at all these other towns. Look at all the rest of Judah. Look at all these other nations. Their gods didn't save them. What makes you think your God's going to save you? Okay? And so that becomes it. But what's interesting is we forget that Sennacherib never comes to Jerusalem. He's down at Lakeish. Right? He's down and he's wreaking havoc on some of these other cities. And then he hears a rumor about Egyptians coming up into Judah. And so he's drawn off to go deal with them because he's protecting his flank, so to speak. He never even comes before Jerusalem. He doesn't raise a shield against it, doesn't shoot an arrow there, never enters the city. I don't know that he ever saw the walls of Jerusalem. He just keeps sending his rap Shekha. Right, and Tarkin or whoever it is to kind of intimidate Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. So he never does it. One night, one angel, 185,000 people. Just incredible. Just, just mind blowing. Right? How many fans of this Razorback Stadium hold? The football stadium? Uh, 70 something thousand. 78. Right. Yeah. Right. Think about that for a minute more than double that number, right? And look at that sea of people, because that's what it looks like, doesn't it? You know, it's just a sea of, of maniacs out there calling hogs. Boom, dead, right? One night, see? Greg, I, I read a commentary one time that said that was more deaths than what you find in World War I, the Korean War, and Vietnam World combined, and it all happened in one night. Quite possibly, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at those photos not too long ago, and I think that's I think that's absolutely right. It wasn't until World War II that things really got out of hand with the with the death. Um, Hundred eighty five thousand. You know, it, it's hard for us to even imagine that and contemplate that. But uh, that's what God did. So there's part one. There's the beginning. There's the end. We're going to take a look at the different segments of it as we go on. Part two is comprised of chapters 40 through 66. Part two is about what? Babylonian captivity. Yeah, the coming Babylonian captivity, right? Uh, so that's brought about by Hezekiah's pride there towards the end of his reign and uh, showing off to the Babylonian envoys there. What's it also about? It's about, okay, here's the coming captivity. That's, that's the front part of the section. But they're going to be rescued from it. About what? But they're going to be rescued from it. He's going to bring them back. Yeah, there's going to be a return. There's going to be a remnant. But mixed in with this, mixed in with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple and the return and Cyrus's great release, what do we find? <coughs> Of Christ. We find all the promises of Christ. We find the servant songs. We find Isaiah combining the physical return and rebuilding of Jerusalem with the spiritual return and a spiritual rebuilding of God's holy city in Zion. And we find prophecy concerning the church. We find prophecy concerning us today that God is actually going to bring about. And that's one of the things that makes um, the book of Isaiah so important to the whole gospel, to the whole center of the Bible, if you will, 
and it makes it so much of a beloved book because it has just these beautiful and wonderful pictures of what God is going to bring about. And we're going to see that here in, in just a minute. But before we go there, let's take a look at chapter 39, verses 5 through 8. Chapter 39, beginning at verse 5, says, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. And this is coming after Isaiah had asked Hezekiah, What have they seen in your house? And how does Hezekiah respond to that? Showed him everything. I showed him everything. Yeah. And the idea is there's, there's some pride here, there's some hubris here. Yeah, he kind of forgets himself and he doesn't walk softly as he said he was going to do. That's like, oh yeah, I showed him everything. I showed him all my treasures. I showed him everything that we've got. And uh, the idea is he's kind of he's kind of boasting there. So Isaiah says, "Has I hear the word of the Lord post? Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left," says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Daniel is most likely among that number. Not that he was the direct descendant of Hezekiah, but he was one of those men who was carried away. And they made eunuchs out of him so they could serve as wise men in the court of the king of Babylon. In verse 8, then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, At least there will be peace and truth in my day. What does verse 8 make you think about? As long as I got it. <laughs> it's like, I'm good. <laughs> it's not going to happen to me. Right? And he's not thinking necessarily about the future of Israel or Judah. He's not thinking about. You know, God's people down the road, he's just thinking about, whew, God's bullet. I'm safe, right? And it really kind of, it really kind of diminishes your respect for Hezekiah just a little bit. You know, that he says that. He's already dodged one bullet, right? You know, Isaiah said he's going to die. He turned his face to the wall and he humbled himself and he cried and he asked for more time. God gave him 15 more years. Now it says, all right, this is what's going to happen. And uh, I don't fully understand how we can think that way. Like, when I think of my kids and I think of my granddaughters, and I'm hoping great grandchildren somehow, I'll never be around and see it. But uh, the idea of I would like them all to be faithful, I'd like them all to be faithful and strong. And if I can't see him here, be able to see him in heaven. You know, I would, I am the first, as far as I know, the only one in my family going all the way back prior to the Civil War, ever been faithful to the gospel. And I would like to hope that something started with me and Shirley, that you'll have many generations that will end up serving God. Doesn't always happen that way, does it? You know, people end up drifting away. And there's that scariest thing about having kids. What is it? What's the scariest thing about having kids? They come with free will. That's it. And there's nothing you can do about that. You can raise them up in the way they should go. And the general principle is that when they're old, they won't depart from it. But guess what? That's just a general principle. You know? And uh, it's, it's pretty tough sometimes. All right, um, so now we have the message at the end of the book, or moving towards the end of the book, chapter 62. Actually, chapters 60, 61, and 62 are very much talking about a future, a very, very far distant future, not just the end of captivity. And we look at chapter 62, verses 11 and 12. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. 
Behold, the good wars are with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you should be and you should be called sought out, a city not forsaken. So clearly when you read that, you think, okay, here's the restoration of Israel, here's the rebuilding of the temple, here's the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But it all ties back to the servant song, and it ties back to the first four verses here um, of chapter 61. In chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes and oil for joy for mourning, to garner the praise of the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins they shall raise up the former desolation, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. And, and you go on and continue to read these beautiful descriptions. Who, who is doing the talking here in the first four verses of chapter 61? Uh, some people suggest it's Isaiah, right? And it may be. But who does this passage make reference to? The, 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 science. the Hebrews, the Jews, uh, when they looked at prophecy, saw that there was an immediate connection as well as a future connection. Mm -hmm. So Isaiah could have been saying these words, the Lord is on the Spirit of the Lord of God is on me, right. in the immediate context, but the reality is that it's messianic prophecy. Yeah, and we know this is a messianic prophecy because Jesus applies these same words to himself over in Luke chapter 4. Take a look at Luke chapter 4. When Jesus returns to Nazareth, he has begun his public ministry, and as he practices, he goes to the synagogue. In verse 16, it says, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. That phrase, he found the place where it was written, there's some debate as to whether or not he intentionally looked for it or that's where they were in the reading. Okay? So this is what he reads. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Why do you suppose the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him? He wanted to hear what he was going to say after that. Yeah, nobody's going to be able to say that the way he's going to be able to say that. You know, he just is like put the emphasis on me, you know, on the personal pronoun. That's like, this this is who I am. And he's going to reveal that. Of course, they're going to become outraged and try to kill him, you know, from off a cliff. And he's going to walk out from their, their midst. But he is reading from Isaiah, you know, chapter 62. It wasn't chapter 62 back then, okay? And it wasn't a book in the sense like we've got a Bible. What was it? It's a scroll, okay? So you've got this big old scroll of Isaiah, and for him to find that spot, right, means that he's unrolling, he's rolling, he's unrolling, he's rolling, he's unrolling. I mean, it's a pretty time-consuming process. So what they would do in their synagogue reading is they would mark the spot 
for the next Sabbath reading. And so chances are, he picked that up, he opened it up, and providentially, that's where it was. I think, I mean, the other part of it is the rest of this chapter could be seen from somebody who wants a physical kingdom, the physical kingdom of Judah to rise up again, and have dominion, and to be a somebody again as a nation. Some of this language through this chapter in Isaiah is like that. It yeah. talks about eating the wealth of the other nations and and their glory will boast. You'll have a double portion and uh, God righting the wrong and turning around their shame and the people looking for that kind of kingdom. Right. This is the year of the Lord's favor. Right. This is, that could be their, that's what they're waiting for. They're like, well, yeah, that, that's what Israel is waiting for. The majority of Israel is looking for that king. And if Jesus would have come to be that king, would he have been crucified? Possibly by the Romans, but not by the Jews. Okay? Um, now, Austin brings up a, a, a good point here. You've got this talking about a very physical idea. But the reality is, is when the temple was rebuilt, when Jerusalem was rebuilt, what was the rest of the history of the Jews like? What was the last 400 years like? They weren't anything. They, they were basically a vassal state. Okay? They never achieved any of the wonderful promises that Isaiah holds out for them. It, it didn't happen. Okay? And that's what leads a lot of... Um, a lot of scholars to look at this and say, this is talking about, yeah, God's going to bring them back. Yeah, that's going to be unheard of. But these things are talking about a spiritual kingdom that's going to happen down the road. So, for example, they will bring the wealth of the nations into it. Okay? What could that possibly be talking about in regards to the spiritual kingdom? kingdom beyond just the Jewish nation. Yeah, just beyond the Jewish nation. Okay? Now, all nations are going to come to it, and the wealth of any nation is its people. Okay? They will bring the wealth of the nations into it. Throughout the book of Isaiah, you're going to read about highways being made between, like, Assyria and Egypt, and both will come to Jerusalem, both will come to the temple, both will come to worship. And so God, even in the first part of the book, is talking about way down the road and what's going to happen with the church and what's going to come. And he can do this and he can say all this and we can understand all this because who's sitting on the throne? God. He is. You know, he's sitting on the throne and he's the one who rules the nations of men. And he is going to accomplish his purpose over time regardless of what any nation does, regardless of whether or not his own people rebel against him, Regardless of whether or not Assyria thinks that you know, it's the one in control, regardless of what Nebuchadnezzar thinks about himself, you know, God has to teach him a few lessons. God's will is going to be done. And I say that brings that out again and again and again. And it's really wonderful. Uh, yeah. Zechariah chapter 9 says pretty much the same thing as Isaiah 62, daughter of Zion, salvation's on the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's it's coming. Jesus Jesus is fulfilling those promises in a way that Israel wasn't looking for and wasn't expecting. And his victory wasn't on, you know, at least in those days it wasn't on a great white horse. In those days it was on a cross. That was his victory. Right? Um it's often said that the number of chapters in Isaiah and their third two-part division um, reflect the books of the Bible. You've got 39 Old Testament books, you've got 39 uh, chapters talking about all the, the strife and the struggle against Assyria. Then you've got 27 books in the New Testament, you've got 27 books in Isaiah talking about the coming kingdom, uh, the New Testament, the coming kingdom. So whether or not that's intentional, whether or not it's a happy coincidence, whether or not it's the providence of God, it is up to you to decide, I guess. Um, man added chapter divisions. I don't know if it was conscious 
at all. But it's kind of interesting how it worked out. Um, when we talk about the Bible, when we talk about a lot of things, our Bible came to us in many ways providentially. Okay? There, there were a lot of things that took place to bring the Bible through all the centuries where we are today that didn't involve miracles that supersede the laws of nature. It, it's just providential. And um, what does the word providential mean? What are we talking about when we're talking about providential? God provides. What? God provides. God provides. Yeah, God provides. And the idea that just because there may not be a specific miracle, the superseding of nature, if you will, that doesn't mean God is still directing things, right? And causing things to happen. And he can do that. You know, it's like think of think of someone stepping, you know, way, way, way back so they can see the whole tapestry. And they realize if I just give this red over here just a little tug. This is what it's going to do all the way up here on the tapestry. We can't see that, but God can do that without violating the will of man. So, all right. Let's take a look at the outline here real quick. Um, what time are you going to ring that bell, Raymond? Eight minutes? Oh. Did you just beat the clock up or first bell? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got the Assyrian period here in the chart. Okay. Chapter 1 stands alone. It is God's indictment against his children. And we're going to deal with that next week. Then we've got chapters 2 through 5, which concern Jerusalem and Judah and God's issues with them. But there's promises. There's good promises in there as well. Chapter 6, we've already dealt with the government of God. Chapter 7 through 12. Is about Assyria, the God of God's kingdom. Then chapters 13 through 23 are about judgments against the nations. And then 24 to 27, about world judgment and deliverance of God's people. Um, then we go back to Jerusalem and Zion. We've got warnings and promises in chapters 28 to 35. And then the whole instance with uh, Hezekiah, Isaiah, Sennacherib. That's the historical link in chapters 36 and 39. And it's such a large book, we're not going to go through it chapter by chapter. We're going to deal with these units. Okay? And we're going to look at the major components of these units as we go along. Then in the second half of the book, you've got the mercy and the majesty of God in chapter 40. It stands alone. Well, you've got Jehovah versus the idols, chapters 41 through 48. That's almost comical, you know, when you're reading it. Um, then you've got the servant of God, the glory of Zion, in chapters 49 through 56, 8. And then you have sin, redemption, and future glory in chapters 56, 9 through 66. Okay. There's some very prominent themes that can be found in Isaiah's writing. Uh, many of these are about the exalted place of God over all creation. Take a look at Isaiah 1 and verse 4. All the way back to this introductory chapter here. A last sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evil doers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Okay? Now, there's one line. In that verse, that stands out in sore thumb. Because it's fundamentally different than the other six or other seven, I should say. Which one is it? It's the Holy One of Israel. Look at all the descriptors of mankind or of Judah. <laughs> Sinful, laden with iniquity, brood of evil doers. Corruptors, forsaking the Lord, provoking him to anger, turned away backward. You have seven negative descriptors of God's people. 
And who have they provoked? The Holy One of Israel. One of the things that I want you to bear in mind when we talk about the Holy One of Israel, Isaiah invokes the name of the Lord 393 times in this book. He talks about God 393 times. He refers to God as the Holy One of Israel 27 times, whereas the rest of the Old Testament only uses the title of eight times. <coughs> so he is, over and over again, in the book of Isaiah, the Holy One of Israel. Also, Isaiah speaks 26 times of salvation, while the rest of the prophets combined only mention salvation seven times. Isaiah is that great looking forward to the church and salvation. Um, look at chapter 40, the other standalone chapter here. 1, 6, and 40 are the uh, three standalone chapters in Isaiah. In chapter 40, at verse 26, how does God describe himself? He said, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. What's he talking about in this verse? When he says, lift your eyes up on high. Well, the previous verse is talking about who are you going to compare me to? Mm -hmm. There is no one like me. That's right. But when he's saying lift your eyes up on high, he's talking about the stars. He calls them all by name. Not one is missing, right? It's one of the great evidences for God that we find in the scriptures. He calls them all by name. He, not one is missing. Um, I can't remember the name of the, the astronomer now. What's the polycarp, I don't think. No, what's polycarp? Galileo. Now, Galileo is the first one that discovered and put forth the idea that the stars were innumerable, just like the scriptures teach, because he invented a telescope. Yeah. He invented a telescope so merchants could see whether or not their trading vessels were on the horizon. Galileo turned it skyward. He lifted up his eyes, and he saw that really the stars were innumerable. And uh, God says, there's no one up there like me, whether it's whether it's idols, whether it's other gods, but you look at that host of heaven, nobody can match me. Go back to Isaiah chapter 5, which is 15 through 16. When you look at the stars tonight, what is it that you're seeing the most of? Are they individual stars? Most of them are galaxies. And then a lot of stars that you would say are individual are in binary systems. There are two stars orbiting one another. Right? So there's a whole lot more than twice as many because a lot of what we call stars are like the Andromeda Galaxy, which is one of the closest to us, that contains, I don't even know how many suns in our own galaxy contain. And then you've got all the, the planets revolving around it. God says, I know them all by name. We don't know what's going on in the other room. You know, it, it's just incredible. And this is what God is trying to bring out in the book of Isaiah. Um, in chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, people shall be brought down. Each man shall be humble, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humble. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. That's just a snippet of a larger section here. But the idea is that all the pride of man is going to be brought to nothing. And who's the only one that's going to be exalted? Only God. That's because of his majesty. Um, and he's going to demonstrate that majesty in judgment. Take a look back over to Isaiah 45, verse 19. In Isaiah 45, verse 19, God says, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. 
I declare things that are right. So God has made himself accessible in his righteousness. And that is a wonderful thing about God. Think about a being who knows the name of every star in the heavens. Think about a being who created all those things. Think about the being who created you. What kind of being do you want that to be? Just powerful? How scary? You want him to be holy? You want him to be just? You want him to be righteous? <coughs> Those are the things that you want about God. And this is what makes him worthy of our worship and our adulation. And then, of course, the New Testament, Isaiah himself, are going to go far beyond that and point out his grace and his mercy and his compassion and his kindness. And he's going to demonstrate all those things through his son, the servant that Isaiah introduces. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen who? You've seen God. You've seen the Father. And you look at Jesus. And it's like, who wouldn't want that for your best friend? Right? Who wouldn't want a relationship with him? That's God. And John makes that very clear in the first 18 verses of his gospel. Jesus is the explanation of God. That's in verse 18. And then uh, I think we've got time for one more. Isaiah 30 and verse 18. Isaiah 30 and verse 18. It says, Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. The Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So he'll be gracious, and because he's gracious, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon him. Wonderful thing. Bring the left hand. How much more time do you have? Are we talking about the first bell? Look, we got two more minutes in the second bell. Uh -huh. those, and, those, and your third bell. Those last two verses that you referenced, you're asking the question <coughs> what, what do you want in a all powerful being? We listed off you know, the, the, the power of God and the, the justice of God. When we were going through that part, the thing that popped in my head was, no, the merciful side yeah. of God, because I'm, I fall short of the standard. So that second verse was reassuring. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and then what did Isaiah say when he was confronted with God in the throne room? Woe is me, for I'm undone. Right? And so we have these wonderful pictures of God's majesty. Next week, before we get into chapter one, we'll deal with question six, and then we'll move on to chapter one real quick. All right, appreciate class. Thank you.
just disappeared. Oh, I have to open it up. We're going to sing number 698, uh, Jordan's Stormy Banks, or it'll be uh, on the, uh, the screen behind here. 698. Uh, Jordan's Stormy everybody here for a period of Bible study. Hope you've been edified and uh, do have a number of guests that are with us and we have a large number of guests that are with us and we're appreciative that you're uh, coming our way. Hope that you'll come by every opportunity that you have. The next opportunity that we'll have to get together will be Sunday morning at nine o'clock. So I uh, look forward to seeing you then if you're in town. All right, so uh, People are not here. Joe and Beth are not here. They're not feeling well. Uh, Lauren's working. Seth's home with Margot. And Lexi Valdez is sick. And so that explains those people. Um, Cindy is still in Pennsylvania or on her way back? Be back Friday. She'll be back Friday. So, But in the meantime, Monty going out. So... <laughs> <clears throat> so Monty will be gone for the weekend, so I keep him in our prayers uh, while he's going to be out of town. Continue to uh, keep pray for Cindy as well. Uh, Melanie Gerholtz, uh aunt passed away in Conway this past Saturday, so we can uh, pray for her and her, her family and see if there's anything we can do for them. Upcoming events. Uh, the church in Little Rock. Uh, Fairview Church uh, is having the youth lecture March 10th and 11th. That information is back there on the back bulletin board, uh, just to the whatever that is of Danny. Uh, so uh, if you want to read more on that, that's back there. Also, the Rogers Church, and I don't think we have a, a uh, flyer on that, but the Rogers Church is having a gospel meeting uh, Sunday the 12th through the 15th. That's March 12th through the 15th. Mark Roberts is going to be evangel doing the, the speaking then. Uh, that is a Sunday through Wednesday, 5 o'clock on Sunday night, uh, 6, 6.30 on Monday and Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, but you'll be here, right? 
Uh, and then uh, there's a singing. Rogers Church will also have a singing on March, on April 21st. That's a Friday night at 6.30. Tim Stevens and Dane Shepard will be there during the, the singing. So avail yourself to that. Plenty of opportunities to uh, be encouraged and to encourage. So. Hi. Right. And the only other thing we got is uh, for the members here. Uh, in your mailbox, you should have gotten a sheet for elder selection and a sheet for deacon selection. Uh, one person, one of my sons, who go unnamed, uh, mentioned that he didn't. He only had one of those sheets in his mailbox. Uh, that's because when I made a print copies back there, I didn't get all of them at the same time, and so. I forgot where I was. So if you won't go in your mailbox and you're missing one of those sheets, there's extra sheets in front of the mailbox, make sure you get one of those. Ah, so that's the, the sheet thing. The next part is, is that if you're putting people's name down, uh, make sure that you have asked them that they and they are willing to do whatever it is. So if you ask someone, they say, would you like to be an elder? And they say, no, don't put their name down there that you talked to them. And they said, yes, don't do that. Same thing for the deacons. Uh, so uh, make sure you talk to them, make sure you get their, uh, get their uh, approval that they're willing to serve in those capacities um, before you turn those in. Those, those sheets are due March 12th, so which is not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, if I'm right. Yeah, I think that's right. So, uh, and then the next step after that, if, after we identified uh, additional deacons who are willing to serve, additional elders who are willing to serve, we'll bring it back for the congregation, who those names are, and, if any, and that will be the time where if you have objection to, uh, to make that known. So, not out loud, not in public, but to make those decisions. So anyway, so that's the process. Uh, anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, well, anyway, certainly glad that everybody's here, and uh, and and let's have a great week. Um, while we were talking about Isaiah, there's a passage of scripture we kind of gloss that we talked about a little bit, and over in Isaiah 46. In verse 9, he said, Remember what happened long ago, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. I declared the end from the beginning and from long ago, not yet done, saying my plan will take place, and I will do all my will. So let's live our lives reflective of the fact that we serve a God and there's no one like him. Not in the heavens, not on the earth, not in the seas below. And that requires an attitude, a, a disposition from us in recognizing that we serve such a God. If there's nothing further, we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for manifesting your love for us by sending your son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we thank you for giving him the power over death so that we too can live eternally with you in heaven. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to come here together to study together. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We pray that these things that we do here equip us to serve you better. Lord, we pray that you're with us for the remainder of this week. We pray that you help us to be better Christians in the future than we have been in the past. Forgive us when we don't honor you. It's in Jesus, our Messiah's name we pray. Amen.